Good evening and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 101, which reads as follows. Saha sampi ce gatha anatta pada sanghita ekang gatha padang seyo yang sutwa upasamati which means very much the same as what we as the verse yesterday. So yesterday it was about a thousand words. Sahasampi Je Padang. No, or Je Waja, no, it's different. Je Waja, which I guess would mean words. Huh, interesting there. Let's see here. Sahasampi Je Waja. So yesterday it was uh, about words a little bit of a different say almost the same verse but a little bit different anyway, the idea is the first one was about word today it's talking about a gata which is a verse or a stanza a gata is a whole like this is a gata that, that I've just said is a, uh, a a stanza I guess or a verse whatever however you say it sahasampi je gata so the meaning is uh, if there should be a thousand words that are unconnected with or not connected hmm. again it's anattapadda so I may have been right anattapadda means the path of uh, the use useless path that are connected with the useless path or not connected with a useful path so they don't lead you in a good direction they, they don't um, teach you something useful. They maybe incline you in the wrong direction, or um, direct your mind in the in towards confusion or towards delusion, or make you angry or upset. Ekangata padang seyo. One gata is better. One one verse is better. Yang sutta upasamati. When one hears it, uh, which which hearing one, which when hearing, makes one tranquil. So again, the the whole idea is of the teaching not taking a lot of time. I'm not going to talk too much about this verse because it's very similar to the last one. But that's okay because we've got a whole story here to talk about, and there's another verse that we do want to talk about that occurs in the. Another quote that we want to talk about that occurs in the uh, in the story. So the story goes that there were a bunch of merchants or uh, some group of men who went sailing, probably to find their fortune. Uh, and halfway through their trip, out on the ocean, I guess, the ship sprung a leak and broke apart. And everyone was drowned, except for a man called Bahia Daruchiria. And if any of you know the story of the elder Bahia, that's what this story is about. So Bahia, being shipwrecked, wound up naked. You know, in order to swim to shore, he had to lose his clothes or his robes or whatever that he was wearing and swim naked to shore and he wound up in a place called Sup, Sup, where was it? Supakara Suparaka Suparaka I don't know where that is but some ocean port on the Indian subcontinent and Being naked, he figured he had to do something to cover his uh, private parts. So he went and found a piece of bark or some something sort of really simple to cover his private parts. And then he picked up a piece of a broken pot and went into the city looking for alms or went into the village looking for alms. So out of an act of desperation, he, he, he became a, a beggar. 
And uh, the funny thing was that when he got to the village, people took one look at him uh, in his sort of uh, hard state of being, you know, maybe he'd been on the ship and he had let his hair grow and his beard grow, so he looked like an ascetic. And uh, so they took one look at him wearing this bark, this piece of bark. I guess there was like sort of a soft bark that you could actually turn into cloth. So he had that wrapped around his private area and using this simple you know, piece of garbage as a, as, a, as a bowl. They thought, wow, here's a real ascetic. And so the rumor started, so they saw him and so everyone gave him food and took care of him and the rumor started spreading that he was an arahant. And it was, it was really because of the way he looked. So uh, as time went on, people tried to give him, uh, tried to give him good, good clothes, tried to give him you know, things that would improve his state, and he, he refused them because he realized, you know, the, the only reason I'm getting such good food from these people is because they think I'm a holy man. And so he totally uh, played up this ruse which um, you know it speaks volumes to or it, it it acts as sort of a commentary on the state of religion in India in the time of the Buddha and even the state of religion today where there's so, so many uh, charlatans or fake ascetics who really have no interest in the teaching but put on the robes as uh, uh, a means of livelihood. Or they put on airs, and pretending to be enlightened, pretending to be mindful, acting, saying things that are mysterious or enigmatic you know, to try and garner support. And so in the beginning it was just a ruse, and he was um, playing it up. You know, acting like an arahant, dressing like an what people thought of as an arahant. Of course, in Buddhism, there's no sense of this being what an arahant looked like or anything. Uh, but eventually, people called him. People were so convinced that he was enlightened that he himself became started to believe it. And he started to feel like. Maybe he did have some spiritual attainments after all. And so as time went on, he got right into the role and got a sense that, well, maybe I am. Maybe I am an arahant. And he was so well taken care of by the people that it just became sort of a... He became a figure in this this uh, this village or this, this society. And he himself started to get stuck there. And he would have been quite stuck um, if it weren't for, the commentary says, one of his blood relatives. And they use this word blood relative actually um, sort of uh, with a double meaning, or, or not with a double meaning, but yeah, they don't really mean blood relative, but it has a different connotation. Why they, they, what they mean by blood relative, what is said, is actually re not referring to his blood relative. It's referring to a fellow religious person in a past life, a fellow monk. So it happens that in the time of the Buddha Kasapa, there were a group of seven monks. And this is actually a fairly well-known story of these monks. This whole story is quite a well-known Buddhist story. So if you're hearing it for the first time, remember it well. You can tell it at Buddhist parties. Tell it to all your Buddhist friends. It's a good story. Well, so far, so good, no? So now we have to go back to the past, though. We've, here we leave Bahia, where he's just starting to give rise to this thought, maybe I am an Arahant. And we have to explain what happened next by going back to the past. It happens that there were these seven monks in the time of the Buddha Kasapa. It was actually after 
the time of the Buddha Kasapa, which is interesting. It's a, it's an it's a, I think a unique description of the um, the the corruption of religion, the corruption of Buddhism. So there were seven monks who were noticing and and really discouraged by the fact that everyone, all the the monks, the novices, the, even the lay people were quite corrupt. The whole society had become corrupt. And so they said to us themselves, and the quote is, so long as our religion has not yet disappeared, we will make our own salvation sure. So they paid respect to the Chaitya, the big golden uh, monument in honor of the Buddha and the Bodhi tree, and then went to the forest, to a mountain, and put, a, put this ladder up so they could climb up to this cliff, sort of this, this isolated cliff halfway up the cliff wall, just like a ledge. And then they cut off or threw down the ladder. And they agreed amongst themselves that they would practice until death. Either death or enlightenment with supernatural powers that would allow them to escape their fate. So like complete and utter dedication. It's like do or die. Written literally, do or die. <clears throat> and so they practiced. I guess the ledge was big enough for them all to do at least sitting meditation. Maybe they didn't do walking meditation. Don't know how big the ledge was. But uh, the, the seven monks... Meditating arduously, ar with ardor, arduously, yeah, that's not the right word, ardently, that's the word. And within a day, now they were totally dedicated, and you can imagine how that affected them and, and encouraged them in their practice. Actually, could be a useful sort of thing. I mean, don't quote me on that, don't go off and try this at home. It's one of those things you want to leave to the experts. We have to remember these guys were were monks, and maybe they didn't. Probably they didn't actually have contact with the Buddha Kasapa. This would have been after he had passed away. So nonetheless, it's something interesting. If uh, someone were so inclined to, <laughs> I don't, can't believe I'm saying that. Probably I shouldn't encourage it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's something that we would encourage in Buddhist countries, but. Out of the interests of not being sued, I think we will not encourage such uh, activity ourselves. Nonetheless, interesting that it happened. An interesting concept. And within a day, the eldest of them, the most senior of them, became an arahant. And became an arahant with powers to levitate his body and fly down and get food. And so he came back with food. This part you don't have to believe. This part is, you know, where we we can decide whether we want to believe or not believe. It's not important. It's not an important part of the story. So if it uh, strikes you the wrong way or if it uh, makes you feel bad you know, or lo makes me lose credibility in your eyes, well, please consider this isn't the important part. The... He came back with food for the other monks and said to them, please eat with me. And the other, and you kind of get the sense he may have just been being kind, but there was something to what he said. Uh, because as an arahant, he could teach them, right? Especially if they were to take food, then he could probably give them some instruction. I'd imagine that was part of his thinking. But the other monks took one look at him and said, Excuse me, did we make this kind of deal that if you went, if you became enlightened, then we would start eating your food, like living off of your enlightenment? And he said, no, we didn't make such a deal. Uh, and they said, well, then if we become enlightened, we will go and get alms food on our own, on our own power. <laughs> and so sure enough, the second day, the second monk became an anagami. Not an arahant, but an anagami. An anagami is someone who has freed themselves from desire, sensual desire, and uh, aversion. So they still have some desire, desire for becoming, wanting to be this, wanting to be that. There's still the concept of 
of conceit. Not exactly self, but kind of a, a bit of an attachment to ideas. But as a result, they are born in the purest of, of pure Brahma worlds. They're called the pure ab abodes. And they live there for billions of years. Until finally they become an arahant there. This realm is so pure that it can only lead to freedom. It might take billions of years, but I don't know how long. I'm assuming it's billions, but lots and lots of years. And he too gained magical powers, so he too went down, brought food back, and the two of them tried to convince the other five to eat, because by now, two days without food or water, they were really doing badly. But the other five were adamant, and they refused the food. And so for the next five days, they strove ardently. And after the seventh day, they all died. All seven of them, actually, I think. And it actually doesn't talk about the other two. You wouldn't think the other two would have died. Maybe they died as well. Let me see. Yeah, no, actually, the, the other, the two that became enlightened probably didn't die there. there there's no sense, it wouldn't make any sense that they did because they were able to leave at, at will. But the other five withered up and died. And were born in the heavens. You know, they were born in a good place because their minds were really set on good things, totally dedicated to goodness. You know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with such a, a thing. I mean, except insofar as people think it's suicide, but not really. It's interesting because in India this was a big thing. Starving yourself to death was considered to be a valid religious practice, not in Buddhism, but in other religions. So these monks weren't exactly starving themselves. Um, they were just putting themselves in, in, in a position where there was nothing would deter them. Probably still not, 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 um, not exactly an encouraged sort of practice. For the reason that you've only got a, about a week before you die. So it's either, it really is either do or die. Anyway, it's an interesting story. Quite well known and discussed. But they were all born in heaven. And eventually became five of the Buddha Gautamas. Um, five people in the time of the Buddha Gautama. I'm not sure if... I can't remember about them all, but... Three of them, at least three of them, became arahants. Anyway, one of the five was Bahia, Daru, Daruchiriya, our guy. So, here he is, after all that, kind of getting the idea that maybe I am an arahant. And it probably is coming partially from his um, intense desire to be an arahant. So he starts to think, hey, maybe this is it, maybe I found it. Even after all these lifetimes, it was still in his, deep in his psyche. And at that moment, we are told, this, the number two elder, who, remember, was born in the Brahma realms, in the Sudhavasa, the pure abodes. And this is like, I guess, lots and lots of years later. But he's still up there. Kind of gets word of it, or... Maybe he's been keeping tabs on his brethren throughout samsara, and so it just happens to uh, happens to to get a sense of what's going on with Bahia, and looks down and starts shaking his head. And I don't know if Brahmas have heads, but he starts uh, he, he realizes the need to go down and say something, go down and uh, fix things, make things right. And he says, "Well, it's uh, you know, I, he is a friend of mine. He is he is a relative in the uh, a brother in the Dhamma. So I have an obligation. I should go and do something. So apparently, this Brahma, this God, basically came down and uh, maybe he, he stirred up a storm or or you know, thunder bolts and lightning, you know, thunder thunder and lightning bolts." And uh, says, Bahia, you are not an arahant, nor are you on the path to become an arahant. 
the practice that you have undertaken is not the practice that leads one to an arahant. You don't have the qualities of an arahant. You are not an arahant. Period. And by his looking up that um, great Brahma, a god, um, telling him this. And I think that would stir up just about anyone. And so he realizes, you know, no, no, clearly I'm not an arahant. This is correct. It's sort of give it's a wake up call. If you don't like that version of the story, you can pretend the story goes that someone came up to him and woke him up and said, Look, you don't look like an arahant, buddy. You're not an arahant. At any rate, he was he was stirred and he asks his friend, um, do you know where there is? Okay, maybe I'm not an arhant, but um, do, do you know of anyone who is? You know, someone I can go to? Because it seems like a good thing to be. Something worth inclining towards. And, you know, here I am, everyone thinks I'm an arhant. It would probably be a good idea to actually become one so I'm not a hypocrite or a, a charlatan. And the deity tells him, in Sawati, that's where you've got to go. To the north of here. Ah, it's to the north. So so this port, Su, what is it called? Suparaka. Suparaka is in the south. And so he sends him on his way. He says, to the north there's a city called Sawati. That's where you have to go. There's a, a Buddha. And Bahia dropped his belongings there and ran throughout the night and arrived at the city of Sabati. Just as you know, he arrived at the city of Sabati and went, asked around and went to uh, went up to some monks and asked where the Buddha was. And they said, oh, he's just gone for alms into the city of Sabati. So Bahia ran towards the city and got to the Buddha just as he was, uh, or as he was walking through the streets. And when he sees the he sees the teacher there in the streets, he bows down, prostrates himself at the Buddha's feet, and says, "Venerable sir, I am uh, at your mercy. Please teach me the Dhamma." And he said, uh, "Where have you? Wh where are you from?" He said, "I come from Suparaka." And he said, "Oh, you've come a long way." He said, no, "Sit down, uh, rest a while. I'm on alms round. Once I finish alms round, then we can we can talk. When I return, just wait here, and when I return, I will teach you." But Bahi is having none of it. He says, "No, please, now." I don't know when I'm going to die, I don't know when you're going to die, I don't know what the future holds. Please, I, I, I mean, I don't need anything big, I don't need a long teaching, just give me a brief, brief teaching, it's fine. And his body is trembling and shaking, he's just so excited and just having seen the Buddha, he said, I found finally. It also could have, probably has something to do with the fact that he had lived with the Buddha before. But he is, uh, he is ecstatic about this. And it says that that's, for that reason the Buddha turned him away and the Buddha put him off. The Buddha said, so again the Buddha says, look, it's not the right time, I'm going on alms. Uh, well, wait, wait. And again, Bahi says, please, please teach me. And for a third time, the Buddha puts him off. And for a third time, Bahi says, no, really. <laughs> Not to be put off, he, he requests for a third time. But uh, the, Buddha, the Buddha actually, at this point, the Buddha did this for a, for a purpose, not actually intending to, to put him off, but to calm him down. So by the third time, Bahi had kind of focused his mind and and calmed himself down and he was ready to learn. And so the Buddha did give him what amounts to one of the, really one of the best uh, simple explanations of vipassana meditation. And so this is the teaching that I think we, ha we, we can 
talk a little bit about rather than actually dealing with the Dhammapada verse tonight. And he says, Evang Bahia Sikitabang. What does he say? Tasmatiha te Bahia Evang Sikitabang. Well then, Bahia, this is how you should train yourself. And then he says, Dite Dittamatang Bohisati. Sutte Suttamatang Bohisati. The full verse and the full teaching is in the Udana, not in the Dhammapada. So this is just a recalling of the events that led up to the teaching. But the gist of it is, Dite Dittamatang Bohisati. Let seeing, let what is seen just be what is seen. Let the seen just be seen. Matta. Matta means strictly or, or just, only, merely. And so what that, that really is the essence of insight meditation. Just hearing this, Sutte Suttamattang Bhuvisati, and then he goes on to say, uh, if you do this, there will be no self for you. There will be no self in this, there will be no self from this. You will have no attachment to here or, or there or anywhere. And just from that very basic teaching, Bahia became an arahat. I'll come back to the teaching in a second, but we'll just finish our story here. After becoming an arahant, it turns out that Bahia didn't have the good fortune. He had never given. Uh, he had never given any gifts of of monastic requisites. Uh, he'd never given robes. He'd never given a bowl. And so they, they, there's an idea that this is somehow a prerequisite for actually being able to ordain. Um, you know, it sounds kind of un, un, improper for me to say this as a monk, but it is sort of the truth. And I think it's worth it bears telling because it's the kind of thing that I personally um, think about. You know, so for those people who, who become monks and are keen to stay as a monk, uh, it's also a very useful thing is to give robes to other monks and make that as a determination. So I'm always trying myself to give robes and give monastic requisites uh, with the intention that it should allow me to always be, to remain in this uh, state of being a monk. It's a support for your own determination to stay as a monk. So I don't think, I think it's it's a useful thing to talk about. Not that I'm saying, you know, hey, give things to monks because, you know, well, that's kind of crass, I suppose. But nonetheless, that's what the commentary says, and it seems reasonable, because he wasn't able to ordain. The Buddha said, he said, please ordain me, and the Buddha didn't say, come monk, because Bahia didn't have the good karma. In fact, if you want to guess what happened to Bahia, it turns out he's one of the five that we talked about last night. If you remember what we talked about last night, as he was searching for a robe, for a bowl and robes to ordain with, he met our infamous cow, the cow that killed five, a number of people in the Buddha's time, Bahia being one of them, gored him on her horn, but as I said, it was supposedly not a cow, it was actually a, a demon in a cow form. Anyway, he died. And the Buddha on his way back from alms round saw Bahia's body lying in a ditch or on the side of the road and told the monks to take his body and to erect a stupa. And so they actually call him Bahia Tera, which is interesting. He's an elder, even though he never ordained. He's one of the 80 great disciples of the Buddha. He's considered to be the, Buddha, the Buddha's chief disciple, in regards to uh, development um, I thought it said here probably does Ah, yeah, preeminent among my disciples who are quick to learn the truth. So he was the one who was able to learn the truth the quickest, go from zero to arahant in the shortest amount of time, the quickest. He was remarkable in that respect because he got very little teaching. Even Sariputta 
heard heard a little bit of teaching and only became an uh, uh, came a sotapanna. Kondanya, when he heard the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, became a sotapanna. Usually, it would take a little bit more teaching than this, but with Bahia, there was a brief teaching in the middle of the in the middle of the road. He was so dedicated that even with a short teaching, it was remarkable in that he was able to become enlightened just by hearing Dite Dite Matang Bhavisati. So the monks were uh, surprised. They said, well, how did he become an Arahant? They said, well, when I just taught him this teaching. And they said, just with that short teaching, he became an Arahant? And again, the Buddha said, oh, no, it's not about how much. It's not about much or little. And then he taught this verse, Sahasampi J. Gatha. You can teach someone a thousand gathas, a thousand verses, and if they're useless, no benefit. But one verse, if it's associated with the verse, it's worth a thousand verses, a thousand useless verses. So it's the quality, not the quantity. That's the verse. But what we have to learn has much more to do with the teaching that he gave to Bahia, because we've already talked about this concept of expressed in the Dhammapada verse. The um, teaching of Dite Dite Matang Bhavisati, just briefly, just to remark at how important that verse is, because it, it describes the essence of, of the practice of objectivity, that we're trying to see things just as they are. It's incomprehensible to most people. You think, well, that's ridiculous. Seeing, of course, is just seeing. That's all it is. But that's only because we've never, if you've never practiced insight meditation, you've never actually explored the, you never actually really deeply come to understand how the mind works. You know, we don't assume, we don't connect our addictions, attachments, our aversions, and and fears and worries and so on with the actual moment-to-moment -moment interactions of our mind and the manner in which our mind interacts with reality. For once you have, it becomes clear that really that's the problem. Is dite is not just dite. Dite is not just what is seen. Is not just what is seen. When you see something, you immediately make more of it than it actually is. It becomes good, bad, me, mine, scary, a problem, troublesome, the goal. It becomes so many different things. And we react accordingly, liking, disliking, uh, becoming obsessed with it, attached to it, clinging to it. So really, the, the essence of our practice is to change that, to change that habit, and in the process to see clearly that those things which we react to are not worth reacting to. So becoming naturally objective uh, to the point where naturally we see things as they are because we have no reason to see them as good or bad we see that we, because we see that it doesn't help we see that treating something as good or bad only gets you caught up in problems this is really essential to overcoming uh, addiction to overcoming aversion to overcoming depression and fear and anxiety it's not to chase it away, not to get upset about it, but just to see it as it is. To see every experience as it is. When someone says something to you that you might like or dislike, it's not the hearing that's the problem. If you just hear it, there's no problem. It's the judging. Judging it as more than just sound. More than just words. More than just speech. And then even when you like or dislike it, you judge the liking or disliking as meaningful. You ascribe some extrinsic meaning to it you say oh this is I like this therefore I should chase after it I dislike it therefore I should tell that person to be quiet or go away so the whole reason why we're practicing meditation is this the whole essence of what we're trying to accomplish with saying to ourselves seeing, seeing or hearing, hearing is just this that it should just be what it is. Now when you do this, it's going to be quite jarring in the beginning. Why people are uncomfortable often practicing this meditation is because it's not comfortable. It's not. It goes against our inclination to cling, to follow, to examine, to extrapolate, to uh, 
uh, continue. And so we've gotten, to, gotten into this rut of our habits, and when you start to break that up and just say seeing, seeing, it's, it can be quite disruptive in the beginning. But quickly, you should be able to see the, 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 the difference once you get skilled at it, which doesn't take very long. You should be able to see one moment where your mind is clear, where you just see, seeing is just seeing. And you can tell the difference between that and our and the alternative of attaching, of clinging, of making more out of things than they are. And this the this state of objectivity is clear, is calm, is uh, pure. The mind is not sullied, is not attached, is not suffering. The mind is at peace in that one moment. So if you have pain and you see it just as pain, you no longer suffer from the pain just in that moment. When you hear something, like see something, feel something that is unpleasant, when you say, when you experience it, remind yourself, and then you just see it as it is. You can see that it actually wasn't a problem in the first place. With practice, this becomes our inclination, and eventually leads us to let go completely and not cling to anything. And that is what leads us to true freedom. So that's how that is useful to us, and uh, it's great. This is a great example. It's a great, sort of an epic, one of those epic stories that uh, wouldn't become a movie in and of itself, I guess, but could be part of a, of a movie about the Buddha. You have this sort of uh, vignette or this look at Bahia. That's a, a great story, especially the ending where this very profound and, and concise teaching of the Buddha reminds us that seeing should just be seeing, hearing should just be hearing, feeling should just be hearing, and thinking should be just thinking. If you do that, there will be no identifying, there will be no clinging, and there will be no suffering. So that's the Dhammapada verse for today, and that's our teaching. So thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best. Keep practicing.